Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? Too loud, too quiet? Good, okay. My name is Angela Mettler. I work in the uh, president's office. I'm an administrative assistant at South Dakota Mines and I would like to welcome you to tonight's STEAM Cafe. Thank you for coming, uh, those of you who are attending in person and online. Uh, we've been doing STEAM Cafe since April of 2018 and it's a partnership between South Dakota Mines, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Hay Camp Brewing. So uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without them and without you. So thank you again for coming. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mark Anderson. He is an instructor in our Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and he's going to be speaking on the aging water infrastructure in America. Thank you, Angela. I think you probably can hear me. I tested this earlier anyway. I hope it's working. I guess uh, for half the audience here, I get a little feedback. Um, I also am an instructor in the GL department too. <laughs> um, so anyway, thanks for coming. Those that are interested in uh, dams, I think this is an interesting uh, uh, topic that's going to play out over the next couple decades. And I think particularly for students that are uh, engaged in science and engineering, I think you'll find this uh, discipline uh, a worthwhile place to be in the next couple decades. So I wanted to talk about uh, obviously the aging infrastructure, but that's not all I plan to talk about. The first thing I wanna do to try to engage the audience a little bit, raise your hand if you live down below a dam. All right, there's more awareness than I thought. Actually, pretty much all of us in the United States live below a dam. Here in Rapid City, of course, we live below three of them, Deerfield, Pactola, and Canyon Lake. But there are 91,000 dams roughly in the United States, and virtually all the major rivers of the United States have been dammed. One exception, that's the Yellowstone River. Yellowstone is the longest undammed river in the United States. So, uh, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about the past. I feel like we got some echo, but um, how did we get here? How did the United States get so many dams and how did we acquire uh, such a passion for building dams? We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about what the situation is today with risk. Um, the risk is in a couple of ways, a risk of failure, but it's also a risk of the financial liability, the cost to repair or replace uh, or remove dams is going to be uh, astronomical. And I wanna talk a little bit about what the future is gonna hold. And I think I might surprise you with what, what's gonna to come towards the end of the talk. So this is the Oahe Dam in 2011. 160,000 cubic feet per second went through that dam as well as all the other dams down through the center of the state. <clears throat> and that, I know some of the students here haven't been to Pactola yet, but to those of you who have, are familiar with Pactola, <clears throat> that would be the full contents, at full pool of Pactola Reservoir passing through there, six of them every day. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later because I'll focus on the uh, uh, Missouri River a, a little more closely, but the, uh, they'd never released that much water through the, the uh, Missouri River dams before. And so even though the corals say, well, it worked out, believe me, it was a nail biter for them. So the past, how did we get here? Um, the oldest dam in the world is known to be 3000 BC. Uh, and I and put this a picture of myself and that's the chief hydrologist of the USGS. We happen to be vacationing. We're walking along the beach in Vancouver, near Vancouver Island on, uh, on Vancouver Island, I should say saw this rivulet and said, let's build a dam. So there's something innate about, uh, you know, you feel like you need to do something with water when it's flowing. So let's talk real, let's start talking about how did we get here by John Wesley Powell. He was the founder of the USGS, but he wrote a pivotal document called the, the Lands of the Arid Regions of the uh, United States. <clears throat> Basically what he made the case was that the settlers back in those 18, in the 1800s couldn't make a go of it if they didn't have water, that there was a requirement to be, be able to irrigate some of these lands of the West. 
And so <clears throat> he was also concerned about the idea that the big corporate companies like the big timber companies and the railroad companies would have the resources and the finances and the attorneys and everything to tie up all the water in the West. So that was part of the rationale for, uh, for creating the uh, USGS, which was providing science for the people. He coined the uh, unit of measure for water of acre foot if you're used to that. But he also argued long and hard for organizing the West by watershed rather than by, uh, you know, latitude, longitude, square. And that's what his proposed map was published back uh, in the late 1800s, looked like uh, his plan for settlement of the West. But I think I wanted to underscore though, uh, is this idea that he was convinced that settlers of the West wouldn't be able to make it if there wasn't irrigation and there wasn't dams. So you wouldn't think it automatically to be true, but uh, when the US Reclamation Service was first established, it was within the US Geological Survey. And the first project was right up the road in Belfouche Reservoir, which is near uh, the town of Belfouche and Newell. And uh, they started building it in 1903. Earthen fill dam, still there. Lots of people enjoy fishing it. Uh, but it's uh, more than 100 years old, eh? So, Dane, how do we, um, is there something I can do to get rid of that bar across the top? Or maybe, well, anyway, let me talk about, so how did we get to this point where we converted all of our rivers to reservoirs, basically? Thank you. The first one, what are some of the forces at work? A lot of this is outlined in the book, Cadillac Desert, if you've never had a chance to hear about it or even read about it. Um, Mark Weiser made quite a name for himself. He's since passed away, but uh, some of the forces at work was the 1930s drought. It was a big deal in the center part in the Western part of the United States. Uh, the Great Depression, of course, went along, went along with that. Unemployment was, was high. And then there was this idea of we got to do something to bring some pride back to the country because of all the um, melees that attended the Great Depression. President Roosevelt, FDR, had proposed these jobs programs, WAPA, uh, CCC. And then post World War II, I mentioned um, a book, or I shouldn't say a book, a report that was written by Vandevar Bush, no relation to any of the Bush presidents. He was the first pre uh, president science advisor. And he wrote, uh, in six months, they put together what was called Science, the Endless Frontier. That report was the charter for the National Science, Fo science Foundation. It basically got the federal government into funding science. But also the reason for that was uh, FDR was concerned that many of the troops that were deployed to World War II would come home and wouldn't have anything to do. So he wanted to uh, take those skills and the advances in technology that happened during that era and put it to domestic use like radar, a lot of advances in chemistry and so on. So that contributed also to uh, the idea of using technology to build dams and society's values. Back then, everybody thought that a dam was an amazing thing. It kind of created water had all these different benefits but not, but for the most part, it ignored fish and wildlife, which are some values that we care about today. And the other thing, every congressman wanted one, a dam in their district. So it was jobs. And so the uh, Floyd Dominey, who was the Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner, had phenomenal power. He did things like, didn't ask Congress. He just took some money that had been appropriated for dam and built the um, Denver your reclamation tech center on down in Denver Federal Center. So this big uh, high seven story building that's not supposed to be there is there because of Floyd Dominey. Anyway, so I'm not working here. Maybe if I go this. Dane, I'm locked up.
There we go. Ah. Okay, so I don't want to make it sound like dams are all bad. Obviously, there are many benefits. Um, flood control, irrigation, municipal water supplies, and of course, recreation. This is a water commissioner, uh, state water commissioner for North Dakota, fishing on uh, the reservoirs up there. But there's also terror. <clears throat> These uh, hydraulic structures, are, of course, are man-made. They're technological things, and they, uh, they can fail. And one of the reasons, uh, one, of course, is inadequate design. Quite a few of the failures have happened because of that. Construction flaws, aging, structural in, uh, earth and fill, and uh, concrete can age. You know, a lot of people, if you live up north where you spread salt on a sidewalk, you'll know that the salt can de uh, degrade the quality of the concrete. And there's quite a few of these dams that were designed under a different climatic era. We're seeing these climate surprises that we never used to see. It's pretty hard to talk about this subject without noting some of the most significant dam failures in the history of the United States. The largest one for loss of life was in Jamestown, Pennsylvania. It was a private dam uh, by the owners of the steel company and uh, South Fork Dam, it was called. At least 2,200, maybe 2,400 people died. Uh, significant because this is the first natural disaster that uh, American Red Cross was involved with, and Clara Barton was actually on the site there uh, aid, giving aid. It also changed uh, American law. Before this time, the, uh, it had to be fault-based needed. In other words, to be responsible and have to pay some money, you had to go to court and they had, they had to prove that you were at fault, in other words, what you did actually caused it. But it changed it now to strict liability. It doesn't mean, as you see now, many companies today they don't actually, didn't actually, you know, weren't the ones that put cyanide in those pills and Tylenol, but yes, they had to pay because they were liable. Uh, real tragedy was uh, the failure of the St. Francis Dam. About 450 people died. Mulholland was a famous engineer. He brought water to Los Angeles. He has this famous uh, speech where they were all gathered and they opened up the aqueduct that delivered water into, into Los Angeles from the Owens Valley. <clears throat> and the only thing he said, he got on the stump and he said, there it is, take it. That was his speech. Anyway, uh, he attended, he, there was concerns about the quality and integrity of this dam from the very beginning. He actually visited the dam in the morning when there were reports of it leaking. And he said, ah, it looks like things are gonna be okay. Of course it failed catastrophically later in the day. Some of the bodies actually were washed clear out to the uh, Pacific Ocean. These are some of the near misses. This is the Fontenelle Dam <clears throat> over Green River, Wyoming. You can see the, the failure scarp there. This was a close one. They managed to throw open all the gates and get the water level down before it catastrophically failed. Of course, the most significant one in terms of how it changed things is the failure of the Teton Dam in uh, Idaho. If you look close, that's a D8 bulldozer and a companion one that went raced down to try to start filling the, uh, the breach in the dam that was, was developing. Both uh, bulldozers got swallowed up. For, fortunately, the, the operators were able to jump off to safety, but so just minutes later, the, the dam failed catastrophically. This dam failed as it was being filled. It had never really operated. It was the first time they put any water in it. It had serious design flaws, some of which were pointed out by the USGS. In fact, uh, one of the USGS reports, they said <clears throat> before the dam was completed, since such a flood could be anticipated, we might consider a series of strategically placed motion picture cameras to document the process. This Teton Dam was actually, we were getting to the point where we're running out of good sites. And like I said, everybody wanted a dam and they started putting dams, proposing them, putting dams in places where they didn't belong. This promulgated the Dam Safety Act, which for many people may know about it, uh, required that dams now be designed to the probable maximum flood. Some of you probably heard that term. Uh, so in the case like locally here, Pactola, they had to raise the, uh, the spillway height of Pactola in response to the Dam Safety Act as a result of that. 
I'm just putting this up here because I think this is captured. If anybody wants to look more in detail, uh, the whole details of uh, uh, the engineering failures and examinations are listed here. Uh, the Violent Dam. I'm going to talk about this because it's a, a geologic interest. Um, this dam in 1963, I actually visited the area uh, for work in, in Italy back uh, 1996. And uh, I got the video there, but I don't think I'll take the time with it. Uh, but basically what happened as the dam filled, it uh, wetted the slope of the hillside above it. And uh, ironically, they had smaller landslides that um, resulted from the base of the slope uh, being saturated. And in response, they'd lower the dam for a while, and then they'd raise it up again. And then it, it finally did uh, fail catastrophically, where twice the volume, I think is what it said, uh, yeah, twice the volume of, wa that, of water that was in the dam was displaced by the mud and rock that slid down into the dam. So it went over the top of the dam and wiped out the town. <laughs> in Rapid City, we lost, I don't know, a really comparatively small percentage of the people of 76. The 1972 flood, this wiped out 94% of all the people that live in that town. So it is one of the largest uh, technical failures uh, anywhere in the world. I like to talk about the Glen Canyon Dam because I work here uh, for the USGS. We did a lot of studies on, on the effect of the dam on the downstream system, the sediment, as well as the, the fisheries and so on. They had a real near miss in 1983. The dam has power, uh, um, the power plant here releases here, and there's some uh, bypass tubes here. But there's also side spillways that go tunneled through the rock. And this is Navajo sandstone now. So it's, um, I mean, it's competent rock, but it's sandstone. I mean, it's, it's easily uh, crumbled, crumbled. But the uh, side spillways go behind where the dam is actually anchored into the walls of the canyon. So I'll go ahead and. Uh, play just a brief video. If I can find it, which one is it is. I thought I had it open. No, I'll do it this way. Okay, I'm just gonna play uh, maybe a little more than a minute or a minute and a half of it. So this is the release out of the bypass tube, they call it. And there's the, this is the actual side spillway. So water is uh, being diverged around. They could tell what was happening by the action of the water emerging from the lower portal flip bucket. On June 19th, the left spillway stopped sweeping, indicating that erosion by cavitation was damaging the concrete tunnel lining. The flow was raised from 12,000 to 17,000 cubic feet per second, and the sweep resumed. But on June 28th, the sweeping again ceased. When the flow was raised, this time to 32,000 cubic feet per second, the increased flow brought forth sandstone-colored water. Pieces of concrete and rock were hurled from the spillway. Obviously, the spillway was being heavily damaged. The okay, flow so... was immediately reduced and the water cleared. By this time, however... What I wanted to say is that it's a little bit like, uh, well... Mrs. Lincoln, other than that, how was the play? I mean, it was a major understatement. We're talking about chunks of rock 
and chunks of concrete the size of cars that were flying out of there. And it wasn't just a little part of that that was turned brown. The whole thing was brown. I mean, and again, what I'm trying to explain is that's where the dam was anchored. And if it had failed, uh, and I can go on, I mean, I can show you more, but the, the way they averted it is they basically stopped using the uh, side spillways because they were being damaged so heavily and they put up plywood, went and got all the plywood they could find and put it up along the face and the water level rose up onto that plywood. So that basically allowed the water level to rise in the reservoir. And fortunately, uh, it didn't basically overtop the whole dam because the inflows basically started to come down. You know, they got a huge break of, by nature. So that was a near miss. It would have been a big deal if this had been. The other issue is the control system for the dam is actually down here, down below the dam. So if the water had overtopped the dam, it would have been trouble doing anything. So let's talk about today where we're at. Um, I suspect you're not that surprised that we have a lot of aging dams, uh, but this is a, is a quote from the Congressional Research Service. As with other structures, as these facilities reach their design lifetime, maintenance requirements tend to increase, and in some cases, the likelihood of failure increases. That's quite a statement for the Congressional Research Service to say. They're basically acknowledging that, you know, we've got a situation where many dams are prone to fail. So this was a recent, just in uh, one year ago, about now, the problem with America is neglected for too long deteriorating dams. So reclamation 10 years ago estimated their repairs were gonna be 3 billion. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about this one as an example. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Orville Dam uh, near Miss. see it. I'm going to do this. I'll just go back and click it. Now the integrity of a major dam in California comes under threat. After days of historic rainfall in the region, William Brangham has our report. At Northern California's Lake Oroville, home to the nation's tallest dam, water levels finally receded, which stopped the overflow of water from the dam's emergency spillway. This reduced the risk of the spillway's complete collapse, which would have triggered uncontrolled flooding and threatened tens of thousands of homes below. At a press conference, local officials couldn't answer why the Listen system failed. I'm not sure anything went wrong. Um, I think... You know, the dam that that system's been installed uh, since the uh, early 1960s. Uh, it's been looked at. It's been monitored. Today, they oh, faced a much tamer scene than on Saturday. Officials had to open the dam's emergency spillway for the first time in 50 years because of record high water levels caused by recent heavy winter rain and snow. When water was drained from the dam's main spillway, the huge volume eroded chunks of concrete and dug a 30-foot deep hole at its base. It was then that officials opened the emergency spillway. When that water started eroding the earthen embankment, officials feared the wall would collapse altogether. And so on Sunday, authorities ordered the evacuation of nearly 200,000 people living below the lake. With little notice, residents were stuck in traffic for hours trying to leave. I panicked as I started putting things in my car, uh, basically my violin, a didgeridoo, some family photos, and I uh, didn't grab enough clothes. I grabbed some wet laundry. Can you believe that? The Mercury News reports that officials ignored warnings about the fragility of the emergency like a lot of dam. Back in 2005, environmental groups warned officials that this other spillway, quote, did not meet modern safety standards. That's the Orville Dam, another near miss. So what does the future hold? This is where I want to talk a little bit. Um, 
So there's definitely enhanced risk of failure of some of these dams. The average age of the Bureau Reclamation, and I said average, which means there's a lot more older than 50 years, uh, is uh, 50 years old. And just last December, just uh, whatever it is, six months ago, a new revised Dam Safety Act program was passed by Congress in which it requires the Corps of Engineers, now BOR will have to do their own, but Corps of Engineers will have to examine all their dams in the United States for quote, risk of failure. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> it's right in the congressional legislation. So obviously they must think it's a risk. So the National Inventory of Dams is uh, uh, online and you can look at all the dams uh, in the United States. There are ni roughly 91,000 now. I think this said 90. 90,000 somewhere, but 91,000 dams, 15,000 of them roughly are considered high hazard, which means it doesn't mean that they're necessarily about to fail, you know, somebody's got their finger in the dike. It means that um, if they did fail, it would be a catastrophic loss of life. So there are two of them actually here in our area that are listed as high hazard, Canyon Lake Dam and Pactola Dam. So I'll talk a little bit about this idea of the so-called death of stationarity. And what this means is that if you're used to making measurements, for example, on a stream over years and over years or flows into a dam or whatever, and you wind up coming up with an average flow, this could also apply to peak discharges too, the same principle applies, but this is what's called a normal Gaussian distribution. In other words, the more years that go by, you should get closer and closer to the true mean. The problem is if the mean is moving, meaning like in our area on the eastern uh, part of the state, things are, the means are moving, it's getting wetter and wetter and wetter, then it doesn't, you ha don't have to move the mean very much to make a big difference on the extremes. So it's this idea that, um, you know, if climate is changing and these means are moving, we can start seeing these these uh, extremes more often, so. And that's a lot of what we're seeing. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about um, sort of this idea of dam removal. So I thought I had one other slide in here first, no. Yeah, I wanted to focus on this. Uh, so what does the future hold? Repair, replace, or remove? So obviously, Secretary Babbitt was an advocate of removing, so his quote, one small blow for salmon when he was Secretary of the Interior swung a sledgehammer at a dam in uh, Butte Creek. And interesting quote, he said, dams are not like the pyramids of Egypt that stand for eternity. They are instruments that should be judged by the health of the rivers to which they belong. So, uh, I don't think, well, maybe yet. I'll watch a few minutes, you can watch a few minutes of this one. So this is the Elwa Dam, which at the time was the largest dam. Uh-oh, got, got an ad. Largest dam in the United States that was removed. Um, this was kind of interesting because you could watch it online. They had cameras, you know, webcam you could watch and uh, they chiseled away at the dam, you know, with hydraulic rams and, uh, and just banged away at it and removed it that way. In other cases, they've done it other ways, but uh, they had barges and with, uh, excavators on it with hammers and just chipped away at it. Is that 60, 55? Coho, it's this is an interesting system. one from the Don't standpoint that I don't think I'll take the time now, but to, to basically this removal of dams so is a much more complex thing that you, than you'd being. think. In particular, um, the near they had to decide the, time, the, the timing of the, the dam removal so the sediment would be released, bridge, uh, not interfere with the fisheries, so there are fisheries people involved, there are sedimentologists involved, there are geomorphologists involved. It gets to be quite a uh, operation the to get these in. in the range that seems to be in a house. The near shore component of it would be the near shore. And so it provides this wonderful little
there's my conduit down. I got it. I'm going to stick with this long enough so you can see the issue of the sediment draining out of the dam. See the issues with getting the sediment out of the dam and washed down through the system. It's, uh, it's not as simple as just blowing up the dam. I'm doing the restoration work on that later. Talked about the Elwa. I'm going to talk about this. I think I still have time, don't I? Uh, Angela. So, this one is interesting from the standpoint that here's a civil engineer and he's, uh, I'm doing this wrong, Arnie Dean. I got those open, but I can't find them. So. we have here and uh, then we also worked together on the Savage Rapids Dam so we had a lot of experience on the Rogue River and uh, so it I made a pretty natural fit River. for us to be able to do this expedited project here on the, the Gold Ray Dam Removal. So usually dam removal is a multi-year process. Uh, fortunately on this project here we had a lot of precedents already set, a lot of people familiar with dam removal and since the Savage Rapids Gold Hill and Elk Creek dams had all come out in this basin within the last three years, there was a lot of understanding of dam removal uh, in the process for permitting and the agencies were very comfortable and familiar with it. And so we were able to very quickly get through this process with a multidisciplinary interagency team uh, that provided input throughout the permitting process during the environmental assessment and things like that. So we removed three dams in the Rogue River. And then we can come back and watch that. He uh, talks about how proud he is talking to his kids about all the dams he's removed, and kids asking, Dad, when's the next one we're going to remove? So uh, this is the largest one to date that's being proposed. Uh, this, this is, uh, I included this because it's actually going to be five dams that are removed on the Klamath River. It will be the largest in US history right now. It's budgeted to cost $450 million to re remove those dams. And that, by the way, that's, um, you know, in, again, salmon country, but. So take a look. You probably had no idea that 1,722 dams have been removed already from the United States. Uh, most of those have been in the last 30 years. 90 dams were removed in 2019. 26 states. So this is kind of the future to come. And uh, uh, I better say something since we're about to come up on June 9th, I'll, I'll say just a couple things about the uh, Canyon Lake Dam failure, uh, which we'll talk about some more in the morning with the class. But uh, so on June 9th, we had these uh, heavy thunderstorms. We had about 31,000 coming down the main channel. Some of you 
are familiar with Cleghorn Canyon, 12,600 combined, at about 41,500 41, CFS coming into the dam. Uh, of course, it wiped out the dam, but the reason it wiped, one of the reasons it wiped, down the dam, wiped out the dam is the design of that spillway. You can see that it was very effective at catching debris, which essentially destroyed its usefulness uh, as a hydraulic structure to pass the, the uh, dam, so, uh, pass the flow. That's what it looked like afterwards. But um, I wanted to point, we'll talk about this later, but just before the dam failed, this was the height of the water above uh, what is now, that was there before, kind of a retaining wall. So we had this um, phenomenal surge above. So you do the look at it and say, well, Canyon Lake Dam doesn't have that much water in it. Well, at the time that the earthen bank failed, it did. And that resulted in this uh, spiking of the peak. So this area under this curve right here, that's the storage that was in Canyon Lake Dam. And the problem was two things, and this part of what really led to the loss of life is you can see how quickly that stage rose. That means if you were there, you had very little time to escape to get to higher ground. It was essentially, well, much like a wall of water. This is some work done by Tom Props in the Civil Department. I'll come back to this. And then I want to talk a little bit now about the Missouri River, and then I'm done. So any engineer knows that vibration is a problem, but I was there when they were releasing the 60, or 160,000 ah, 160, CFS, but it didn't go on just for a few days. It went on for months. And I was there, I went and grabbed the railings and you could just feel the vibration. And that vibration went on for months. The largest release that they had had before was 55,000. So I call it a near miss. Uh, I'll come back to that. I want to show you this one. And then that's. I wonder if I have. I don't know why they don't show up when I need them to. According to studies, there's one food that raises testosterone by 52% and 78% increase in overall sexual health. So Dang ads. Oh, oh sexual health. We all need about that. When flood submerged the St. Louis region back in 1993, we were told it was a once in a lifetime event. Well, one man who has studied the Missouri River for more than four decades says an even bigger flood disaster could be looming. The reason took five on your side investigates up the Missouri River all the way to Montana. Glasgow, Montana, population 3,300, is best known for two things. It's quiet and they show train coming by. But not far away, holding back one of the biggest reservoirs of the world and sitting on the Missouri River is the Fort Peck Dam, 21,000 feet long, 250 feet high almost 80 years old and counting. I believe it's the most hazardous dam in North America. This doesn't look like that. No, it looks like sort of a, a long hill. Dr. Bernard Shanks is a former land and wildlife advisor to the governors of California and Arizona and has been studying the dams on the Missouri River for more than four decades. He says the problem starts with how Fort Peck Dam was built, which the Army Corps of Engineers describes this way. The dam itself was constructed out of hydraulic fill, which is basically a slurry of mud and water pumped from both downstream and upstream of the dam location. So it's not a safe methodology to build dams. Because, Shanks says, it makes them more likely to collapse suddenly and catastrophically. In fact, it's something that happened during the dam's construction in 1938. 135 men were caught in it. Eight of them died. And six were never found. Their bodies lost in the walls of the dam, where they remain today. It was a dramatic illustration of a fundamental weakness 
in this dam. And that's why Dr. Shanks is raising the red flag, because if a dam this big were to fail, he says there would be deadly consequences downstream. It would make the damage from 9-11 look like just a drive-by shooting. Dr. Shanks says a Fort Peck failure could lead to a domino-like collapse of all five downstream dams on the way to St. Louis, beginning with Garrison and Oahe. Along the way, that much water would wash out probably dozens of bridges, railroad bridges, highways, pipelines. Uh, that house is uh, starting to go. For many St. Louisans, when they think of floods, they think of 1993. Would this be worse? Oh, much worse. This would be the worst flood in American history. After epic flooding in 2011, the Army Corps of Engineers proposed $225 million in repairs to the Fort Peck Dam. They only got about a fifth of that. Most of that was used to repair this spillway, which had to be opened in 2011 to ensure that water didn't overflow the dam. You know, we're competing with all the other projects across the nation for funding. We take that funding and use it to the best of our ability and maximize that opportunity to do the repairs that are most critical. But the Corps tells Five on Your Side, the flood event of 2011 gave them even more confidence in the Missouri. Okay, so I have no idea dam system. what the, the risk coast, really is the operator does design. Uh, for the Fort to... Peck Dam, and I'm not predicting that. But Mr. Shank is right. If it did, if that dam did fail catastrophically and it was mostly full, it would wipe out all the dams all the way down because they're all earthen dams. Um, by the way, the picture there is they're still doing repairs on the Fort Peck Dam from the 2011 flood, and they're hurrying to get it completed before the upcoming uh, event. Now, unless you think this is an odd and a possibly an impossible event that one dam failure could lead to subsequent other ones, uh, I won't take time to, to go through the uh, video, but this is a video uh, talking about the, the uh, Bang, Bangkwa Dam in China, considered to be the worst technological disaster in history. Uh, there's a the video has got a whole lot of information and background about it. But when it failed, it caused the cascade of the failure of 62 more dams downstream. So, uh, so lest you think there's not a historical precedent to what Mr. Shanks was talking about, there is in China. Okay, one of my favorite quotes is by George Catlin. He traveled the uh, Northern Great Plains uh, painting the Native American Indians and produced some of the best uh, documentation of what their uh, native customs, in fact, his books are called The Manners and Custom, Customs of the North American Indians. He said, the Missouri is perhaps different in appearance and character, character from all other rivers in the world, there is a terror in its manner, which is sensibly felt the moment we enter its muddy waters from the Mississippi. So anyway, I just wanna sum up by saying one thing, we have a huge looming uh, financial burden, so to speak, for this country to try to figure out what to do with these dams. I think engineers and scientists are gonna be figuring out whether to repair it, remove it, or uh, replace it or remove it. I think because of the cost and the number of them, I think we're gonna see a lot more dam removal uh, in the next decade or two than, than we've seen in the past, just because of, mainly because of the cost. So with that, thanks for your attention. That's what I have. And I don't know, Angela, if there's any questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, first, thanks for your presentation. It was all fantastic. I have a question about uh, kind of at risk dams. We talked about during the recent time, and as they've been examining the construction of this country. And it's a question of, I guess, uh, design versus age versus maintenance. Like, there's dams that are at risk, and I'm sure they're all very different. But to what extent are these dams performing as expected that hasn't been maintained, or are they kind of showing us where before? 
Well, that's a fair question. I, I think one of the things I wanted to try to mention, maybe I didn't underscore it enough, but virtually all these major dam failures had precursors. People saw it coming and thought that you know it wasn't a problem. You know, one of the things about the other thing I didn't mention, but uh, with regards to the Missouri River dams, is there's is also this nagging issue about tribal harm. Um, this is um, you know many of the tribes, river tribes, we call them that lived down along the river, got displaced up to Eagle Butte and Fort Thompson and new, new town up in North Dakota. And um, that's a burr under their saddle that it'll be interesting to see what happens when, when it comes time to make a decision. Well, you know, Wahi Dam has been very useful, uh, but you know, to replace it, it's gonna cost this much and we probably don't wanna do earth and fill again, we want to do, you know what I mean? So I, I might've skirted your issue a little bit, but, but I think um, uh, that's gonna be the tough call is whether you maintain them or you remove them. And uh, uh, that's why I, I hope I'm around a long, long enough to be in some of the rooms when this is debated, because I, I didn't feature it, but uh, probably the biggest debate right now is about the four Snake River dams out in Idaho. Um, they put four in that have shut off salmon migration. And what they do now is they barge the little buggers. They, they kind of put the fry and kind of herd them into these huge barges. And then they barge them all the way down the Columbia River and release them and hope they get to the ocean. Yeah, and there's more to talk about with the Missouri River. Of course, the, you know, the, the Gavin's Point down below, that, that dam is essentially filled with sand. Um, I mean, the reservoir behind it. Um, and its life expectancy is, is really, really shortened because of this sediment accumulation. And so you're right. I mean, uh, virtually every dam has its own story. And, uh, but uh, I don't know what else to say. I, I just think that with the changing societal values. I mean, people are willing to give up um, the expense of these dams in hopes of saving the spring Chinook salmon out there and coming up there. And there is one other thing that I didn't mention is there is this idea of disruptive innovation. In other words, we like the hydropower now and the electricity and stuff, but what happens if we can generate electricity and not have to sim electricity so far through the grid. And the grid is a major vulnerability. That's what happened down in you know, Texas and Louisiana recently. It wasn't really the generation power, it was the grid was down. So if you could do distributed generation using uh, you know, uh, small nuclear, or you can find a way to store uh, ener energy in uh, Tesla's battery systems that he has and uh, so on, you know, the hydropower may not be as critical as it used to be. So I think we're on the verge of some disruptive innovation in terms of how we generate electricity too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think there's probably a good and bad to every story or every dam. For example, um, all the dams that were built in South Dakota yeah, I guess for that matter, also up in North Dakota with Garrison, they actually were built with the primary purpose of uh, flood protection. But who are they protecting? They're protecting the downstream cities. They're, they're protect, supposedly protecting Omaha and St. Louis. So for South Dakota and North Dakota get no benefit out of it at all, except you know for the, the um, uh, recreation benefits, water skiing and walleye fishing and that sort of thing. But I actually teach this in the, in the civil department, water law and water policy. But um, so the Missouri River dams, the primary purpose was the uh, flood control because, um, because the, they've been ravaged so many times downriver. Um, 
And the idea was that South Dakota was supposed to get massive irrigation projects. The so-called Oahe Diversion Project was gonna irrigate all of Eastern South Dakota. And uh, Senator McGovern kept pushing it and the farmers didn't want it and he actually wound up losing his election. So we don't hear much about McGovern. Of course, he's passed away now, but anyway, that's, that's another topic. <laughs> What's the fun of, what's the fundamental what? Okay, so the criteria to get on the list is uh, is is only that there are a significant number of people at risk if it were to fail. So we've got Rapid City, we've got a lot of people living along the creek and so forth. It isn't like I said, it isn't necessarily that there's identified flaws in the dam and it's you know weakened and it's likely to, um, to fail. It's, it's just if it did fail, um, a lot of lives would be at risk. Yeah, so that destroys one of the important purposes of a dam is if, if it can store store water. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the issue with uh, the garrison. Well, behind garrison is is a lake. Something in, no, no, that's up in North Dakota. Oh, I'm sorry. I always get garrison dam, which is in North Dakota with Gavin's Point, which is in South Dakota, which is... Um, Got another pond behind it that gets filled up with sand from the Niobrara River. But uh, anyway, so yeah, it takes one of, away one of the important purposes of the dam is if it doesn't have any storage capacity left. In fact, there's been uh, studies that have been looked into by the Corps of Engineers to find a way to um, take a pipeline and uh, pump the sand and water around the dam to deliver um, sand down below the dam. And, Part of the reason for that is, uh, this is getting in, into another area, but um, water on a river likes to carry sediment. And so the water coming out of a dam is clear, right? Well, it wants to pick up some sediment. So almost all dams below, you know, below the dam has, have erosion problems. Either the, the channel starts meandering more to grab its sediment load and so forth or it can downgrade. That's one of the things that's happened in Sioux City. The, the uh, bed of the stream keeps getting deeper because of the river is picking up sand and sediment. So anyway, so we've got a lot of them. I think we're gonna have fewer in the future, that's all. But it's gonna take some expertise to figure out how to make the right decisions and also get them removed without further hazard. So. Thank you again for coming everyone. Uh, we do this every third Tuesday, so next month it's going to be on June 15th, 6 p.m., same place. Um, and the speaker is uh, Kaylee Johnson, who works in our Museum of Geology. She's in the process of preserving a T-Rex jaw, and so she's going to talk about that. She was originally scheduled to speak in March, uh, but it had a conflict, and so we moved it to next month. So we hope to see you then. Thank you. <laughs>